Approximately one in five people suffer from an autoimmune disease. An autoimmune disease is a condition arising from an abnormal immune response to a normal body part. There are at least 80 types of autoimmune diseases. The cause is generally unknown. Some autoimmune diseases such as lupus run in families and certain cases may be triggered by infection or environmental factors. Some common diseases that are generally considered autoimmune include celiac disease, diabetes type 1, Graves disease, inflammatory bowel disease, multiple sclerosis, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and Hashimoto's. We recognize that you need some help if you are suffering from one of these autoimmune diseases. That is why we have created our therapeutic autoimmune program. The program is a 13-week program in which you'll have weekly check-in calls with your very own nutrition coach. Your nutrition coach will help you out with all things nutrition and lifestyle to help you better your symptoms. If you are suffering from an autoimmune disease, you do not have to do it alone. The team at The Chief Life are here to support you 100% of the way. You can find out more about the therapeutic autoimmune program on our website, www.thechieflife.com and look underneath the nutrition tab. Guys, what is up? I just wanted to quickly let you know that we are now running free nutrition consults at www.thechieflife.com. You can book in for a quick 15-minute consult where we get to talk about all things nutrition, all things lifestyle with one of our fantastic nutrition coaches. So if that is something that you feel you are in need of, please jump across to www.thechieflife.com. Can't wait to see you guys booking in. Welcome to the Chief Life Podcast, where we deliver guests and knowledge from around the world right to your ears, focusing on nutrition, exercise, health, and wellness. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Guys, welcome to the Chief Life Podcast. I'm Matthias Turner, and today I have Terry Cochran on the line. Terry, welcome. Oh, so good to be with your audience. So, I mean, I'm really excited about this one. You, uh, the creator of Wild Wildatarian Diet, and uh, we're going to really dive deep onto this one to, to find out where it came from and what it's all about. Um, I think a lot of people have heard of um, veganism, a lot of people have heard of carnivore, a lot of people have heard of plant-based and kind of a mix of all of the three, but Wildatarian is another addition to it, and I'm really excited to kind of dive deeper into why uh, wild meats, wild foods are probably a better option for people to be having. So... First of all, Terry, I think what would be a good place to start is like, give us a background on yourself. Like, how did you kind of come, or what was your life before Wildatarian? and how did you come into the Wildatarian diet? Well, I'd love to share that with you, Maddie. Uh, I, if you would have asked me 20 years ago, Terry, are you going to be an internationally known uh, integrative practitioner pioneering some really cool stuff? I would have said, no, I'm, I'm operating a billion dollar organization running a risk management of uh, multifamily portfolios with, for one of the largest uh, companies in the U.S. Wow. Um, but sometimes when life throws you what you think is a really big curveball, it really becomes a huge blessing. Mm -hmm. And so my son, when he was born, by the age of three, we were told that he would not be normal, that he would have brain seizures, hmm. that he would not grow past five foot four. We had we spent uh, many days in the hospital, many years in the hospital with life threatening asthma, bleeding eczema, failure to thrive. And I went down the traditional medical route for years. And uh, at one point I decided it's not working. I'm a risk manager. Let's figure out how I can manage his health risk. Mm -hmm. And so I went into deeply anything and everything having to do with food, having to do with an endocrine system, why his body had had uh, manifested in the symptomology that was just making him sicker with the medicines that he was taking. And so I figured him out and uh, he's now a beautifully handsome and well 25 year old. Uh -huh. This is this happened when he was three. And I left my corporate career 15 years ago, and over these 15 years, I'm an ever learner. And Wildatarian was actually born from an end stage cancer client that was riddled with amyloid doses. Mm -hmm. These are truncated protein structures. And in his case, 
they had accumulated around his heart mm. and two rounds of chemo sent him into co- uh, congestive heart and kidney failure. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And he had been given his last rites and they found us. And I didn't understand amyloids at the time. It was over eight years ago. But I had um, on my staff uh, a an expatriate of, of the National Institutes of Health, which is one of our top research facilities here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And she had a genetics researcher. And so I uh, I tasked her with trying to understand what these misfolded proteins were and why they were happening in our body. And so, and I was doing independent research and we figured out, my goodness, they're coming from the food supply. Mm -hmm. And within uh, three months of understanding that that and putting him on, he was my patient zero wildatarian. Uh, His light chains, which are a marker of the cancer he was having, were normalized. Wow. And so... It was really beautiful, and he was able to then restart his chemo, and he is living and riding his bike to work seven years later. Hmm. So this is the genesis of Wild Yeah. If you amazing. stop feeding the body with these things that uh, feed us uh, into very bad outcomes, the body can resolve. How, how diverse was the diet um, compared to what he was having beforehand? That's a great question. So with most chemo, uh, chemo depletes protein stores. Mm-hmm. And so he was being asked to eat a very rich protein diet post chemotherapy. Well, the protein that he was being asked to eat, primarily chicken, because it was deemed to be a clean protein, mm-hmm. we now know through clinical studies and actually the clinical outcomes in our practice that chicken I call the dirty bird. At least in the United States here, it contains the highest amyloid load of domesticated animals. And it's because of their crowding conditions. The crowding conditions create an environment for these animals to create these misfolded proteins in their bodies. Mm. When we test them, we then can no longer digest them. And the studies out of Cambridge and Japan have linked these amyloids to contributing to cancer, to kidney disease, to autoimmunity, to Parkinson's, to ALS, to Alzheimer's. So um, this was really an interesting uh, place for him that his kidney failure and heart failure, initially we had to make him very plant-based, but his plant also had to be low mycotoxin. So Mm -hmm. the pea protein, which is also given in in cancer therapy, was no bueno for him because that's a toxin that was actually feeding the amyloid load which was then feeding his his situation wow and we 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 eventually realized that the amyloids were actually tripping a virus called the cytomegalovirus which actually creates all sorts of cancers uh, or contributes to the creation of cancers and so um we went from him being vegan because he had such um, delicate structure to then we slowly started moving him into some light fish and then he was able to eat some bison and venison and then lamb which is so important for the the, the collagen because of the conjugated linolytic acid uh, lamb is so is so rich in that and so he became a low sulfur wild vegetarian because sulfur uh, those healthy foods such as kale and broccoli and uh, cabbage were actually hurting his system as well yeah, and wow. uh, he's He's just a really beautiful story of nothing is impossible. Yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. And I mean, there's so much that can really be unpacked just there. Maybe if we could dive a little bit more into the amyloids, like maybe just explain for the listeners, like what, what are the amyloids and why, why should we kind of be, I guess, paying attention to them? So amyloids, actually, our bodies make amyloids naturally. Mm-hmm. They're part of our homeostatic mechanism for managing inflammation. But when we consume or make more amyloids than our body is supposed to break down or can break down, then we're in trouble. And so amyloids are misfolded proteins. Mm -hmm. And why are proteins so important? Proteins, basically the genesis of life. Mm -hmm. It helps build our tendons, our hormones, our neurotransmitters. It helps with all of our endocrine systems. Protein signals DNA. Yeah. And so we have these aberrant proteins, the body doesn't understand them, so our signaling mechanism becomes impaired, and that is the fire starter for an epigenetic expression, meaning that it trips our genes into behaving not the way they're supposed to behave. Yeah. So again, these these amyloids have now been linked to these 
to contributing to these very large, scary conditions Mm -hmm. that cost, you know, billions and billions of dollars a year in health, healthcare. Diabetes is another one. Yeah. Wow. That's, uh, it's definitely insightful. And I mean, like you said, it's pretty much every enzymatic level we we use proteins, right? Like everything within the body. Yes. And so many people, I think, um, like obviously within within the ve- ve- uh, sorry vegan and vegetarian world, even the plant-based world, like they still have a focus on proteins, but probably not as much as what they potentially should do, I think. Um, and we, we typically see after like three to six months of people going vegan or plant-based that they do laps. And that's when they need to really kind of focus in on, okay, well, what's going on? On where are the proteins going wrong and what do we need to be focusing on to make sure that everything's going to move forward and not be upsetting the body instead. Um, you also talked about CLA before. It, what happens if you were to take a synthetic variation at that level? Um, would it not be the same as if you were to take it from, say, lamb? Uh, conjugated little CLA is a wonderful essential fatty acid that's so important for our cell membranes. And why are our cell membranes... Uh, important in our physiology and who we are is that we now know, and I was just, uh, I just spent some time with the um, magical Dr. Bruce Lipton, who's considered the father of epigenetics, uh, who's written a book called The Biology of Belief, who is world renowned in his genius. And uh, we were talking about just this, the protein signaling, and actually why the cell membrane is so important. It is now considered, as he said, Hey, guys, the word brain is in there. (laughs) So (laughs) it is actually the brain of the cell. And so the cell membrane is actually made up of the fats that we have consumed over the last 90 days. Mm -hmm. And so if we are consuming trans fats, fats that can't be broken down, then the cell membrane becomes brittle and what I call unselectively permeable. And Mm -hmm. what we want the cell membrane to be, is we want it to be really smart And we want it to be selectively permeable, meaning only let in that which helps it be stronger and keep out like like a kind of a balloon. It'll pop away or not let in that which doesn't serve it. Mm. And so fats are super, super important and super important in longevity. It's important for our brain. It's important for our cells. And so the right kind of fats are super key. Now, CLA, as long as you know the source, you know, if the CLA is coming from lamb, then and if it's coming from happy lamb, not lamb that has been, you know, uh, pesticides, bad stuff, then that can also work well. But I I love lamb broth Mm. and even lamb bone. I say Altitarian approach is that you use every bit of the animal because we're a sustainable based approach. And so you can take lamb chops, keep the bones, make broth dry the bones, pulverize the bones and put the bones back into broth or put them into your smoothies or put them into your oatmeal or whatever. And you have that rich CLA. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, so, I mean, we haven't really delved deep or too deep into what the wildatarian diet actually covers. So, um, maybe if you could kind of unpack it a little bit more like we did here. Obviously, you started with the plant base. You moved into a little bit of fish and then you moved into a little bit of wild game with him. Um, let's talk a little deeper into what the wildatarian diet actually is. So the tenets of the wildatarian diet are based on three big tenets, and they are protein, Mm -hmm. which is the amyloids, fat, which is we have to make sure we're using the fats appropriately so it can enrich us rather than break us down, and sulfur malabsorption. So through my 15 years of clinical outcomes in my practice and my ever um, quest to be thirsty for additional knowledge, we have found that those three things with a sidebar of oxalate metabolism, because oxalates are new in the in the uh, world of um, autism and kidney disease and PANDAS, which is pediatric autoimmune anxiety disorder and other conditions, we find that the body is less robust in being able to metabolize protein, fat, and sulfur mm-hmm. and oxalates. And so so why is sulfur such a problem? Sulfur, again, it's supposed to be like those original amyloids. They're supposed to be super important for our neurotransmitters and for our gut health and for collagen structure and for um, all that has to do with our endocrine function. But here in the United States, at least, this nasty pesticide by the name of Roundup, which contains the poison of glyphosate, yeah. has stopped 
the body's ability to convert in many cases, not in all cases, but it interrupts the body's ability to convert sulfur into its end product needed by the body called sulfate. Mm -hmm. And so sulfate does all those things that I said it's supposed to do, but we get caught into this vortex of this un, uh, un end state element. And so then what happens with sulfur is that which is supposed to support disrupts. Mm -hmm. So it disrupts nervous system activity and neurotransmitters and gut 73% of rheumatoid arthritis has been linked to impaired sulfur processing mechanism. Hmm. We work a lot with RA here. We work a lot with lupus. We work a lot with mental health conditions. We work a lot with gut, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, irritable bowel, um, all those linked to sulfur. And yeah, so well. these healthy foods, which used to serve us, are now becoming bullies against our favor. Yeah, so the answer is not just getting more sulfur into the body, obviously, because it just creates more of an issue. Exactly. And so the thing is, especially if you have a genetic predisposition, because the overarching um, idea around the wild vegetarian diet is eating to your genetic blueprint and your current state of health. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is I've taken deep scientific algorithms and I've converted it into an easy consumable book where you can take a quiz, because effectively when I'm asking you, do you have, um, bur do you burp after you're eating? Well, that's a sign of protein malabsorption, but really what it is is that you're not producing hydrochloric acid. And where is that coming from? Well, you might not have the methyl donors to help you produce the hydrochloric acid, which means that you might have a gene polymorphism in the methylation pathway that's not robust. So that simple question really helps me figure out, are you part potentially not methylating appropriately, mm. right? Um, similarly, if you if you urinate and you can smell asparagus or if you have a history of arthritis in your family, if you're really sensitive to sulfa based drugs, right? That's like a clear canary in the coal mine. Yeah. Then you probably have one of these polymorphisms, the CBS gene, which is cystathione beta synthase or the SUOX gene or the BH4 gene, which doesn't allow you to break down sulfur very well. And the body has expressed those genes, which then make it really more difficult to eat those healthy air quote healthy foods mm -hmm. um, and are you so, typically finding with the groups that you're you're working with like um that this is the issue it comes back to the sulfur mainly yes back to the sulfur and it's not for everyone and, and i have i have the genetic uh predispositions not to be able to be a robust assimilator of sulfur now does that mean that i never eat broccoli well i was just away for six days and i did eat some broccoli and i did have a little bit of garlic which is also sulfur mm -hmm. but i also use some supplementation to help me support those opening up those fat pathways up regulating those genetic polymorphisms so then i don't get so impacted by those foods that might otherwise really impact me and I'm not really chomping them down every day and I will never drink a smoothie that's made with kale. I call it killer kale because kale is so sulfur rich and it also pulls in a lot of a lot of pesticides and it's like a sponge yeah. for, for toxins. Which is so crazy because it's getting pushed so much as a superfood right now. Yes, it is. Killer kale, I call it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, if you're getting organic variation of kale, even though it's organic, it's still going to have high levels of sulfur in it, right? It still have le high levels of sulfur and high levels of oxalate, which is another sidebar to the wild deterianism approach. And oxalates have been linked to kidney, kidney stones and gallstones. But in the United States, they've also been linked, especially if you have a genetic predisposition and you've had some fungi in your body in the past, uh, candida overgrowth, uh, fungal overgrowth, then that actually, those, those, those oxalates actually create aspergillus, which is a fungus, which then disrupts all sorts of other pathways. Hmm. And um, fungal only being in the intestinal tract or anywhere on the body? It can be systemic. I mean, we have found that um, in it, these organisms, we're finding that they hide in little places all over our body. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just have to be GI tract. You know, if you have if you have a, a toe fungus, it's, it's going to be in your toes. But also, what we find is that candida can travel through the lymphatic system, which is a <laughs> fungal organism, to the brain really, really creating some massively bad things with dopamine regulation. And yeah, so wow. you can become CD or you can, the PANDAS, the pediatric autoimmune psychiatric disorder, really linked to candida and, and uh, strep. So strep, which is a bacteria 
bacteria mm-hmm. that becomes overgrown and they feed each other. They're like, they're like, you know, bad, evil cousins. Yeah, yeah. Um, each other. Um, and so, yes, these things really, they do travel. Wow, that's insane. So, going back to um, sulfur malabsorption, what what is kind of the protocol for, I guess, changing it around so you can start to absorb this properly? Yes. So, we really like um, a B6 vitamin in the form of P5P, and that really helps with both sulfur and oxalate metabolism. Mm -hmm. We really like sometimes molybdenum, which is... um, a mineral, it's really been very, very efficacious in a, in the SUOX gene, yeah. uh, polymorphism. Uh, but if you have gout, so there's always a but, right? Mm. Um, if you have gout levels, then too high molybdenum would, would exacerbate gout. So okay. that's, that's where purine levels don't serve you in purines or, for example, asparagus and almonds tend to be high purine foods. Could, could it bring on gout for someone who has a family history of it, but they haven't got it themselves? Absolutely. Yeah. I just actually, I just talked to a, a premier scientist. I was at a conference with a neuroscience and quantum physics uh, and epigenetics this past week, and um, they said, "Terry, I overate asparagus, and all of a sudden, I tripped myself into into a gout wow. situation." Yeah. So, absolutely. Yeah. But so you crazy. can also turn it off. You know, this is the thing. We mm. do not have to be a product of our genes. So, yes. You know. It's, it's when the signaling mechanisms become interrupted that these genes are expressed. And so to the third piece of the wildetarian um, construct is fat malabsorption. And so why is that so important? Because I use fat as a construct for stress because the hormones of stress, of cortisol and epinephrine, I call them cupcakes mm. because they're fats and sugars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Uh, and I say stop cupcaking yourself because it's really you could be eating a cupcake every hour even though you've never touched one Um, and so what's so deleterious about this Maddie is that in particular adrenaline also known as epinephrine has these multiple deleterious effects on the body this is when we go into our fight or flight this is when you know, we were we were made as humans to be able to push sugar to our limbs so then we could, you know, run from that saber tooth tiger. And then the body would go back into from fight or flight to rest and restore. Yeah. But our modern our modern lives and all of the, you know, the, 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 the technology that's actually helping us uh, speak to one another from across uh, halfway across the world is actually emitting a frequency that can actually affect our nervous system. So that's why we have to use modulating um, modulating tactics to help manage that. But in particular, stress will open up the tight junctions of our gut. Again, just like the cell membrane, it's meant to be selectively permeable. So we go from what I call pantyhose, where only the smallest molecules break through the barrier, which are already pre-digested, to fishnet stockings, meaning mm-hmm. that bigger molecules can break through and that can cause a histamine antigen autoimmune response in the body. So it opens up those junctures. Yeah. It actually increases. There's these little pathogens, these little strep and candida and the viruses, they have flagella. They're like little antenna. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and stress actually activates the flagella to say, hey guys, let's have a party. And then they come together, they aggregate and they become bullies against our favor. <laughs> and so, and then the third thing that it does is it just, it because it's such a fat, it makes us fat malabsorbed because it, the, that fat breaks through our intestinal barrier, moving into our lymphatic system, clogging up the works because lymph is one of the bigger um, ways that we can uh, metabolize all the bad stuff. You know, the lymph is like clearing stuff up. And so stress can really make us not able to process fats because we're effectively pushing fat through our system on a constant basis. And so then that wonderful cashew butter that you eat, especially if you're a woman and have certain genetic predispositions, can actually back you up in terms of your detoxification pathways because you've hit your tipping point of what is the right and amount of fat for you. Mm-hmm. And what, how do we know if we're, we're over fatted? Well, again, my simple questions, look at your stool. Is it floating? Is it greasy? Is it light colored? Do you have a history of gallbladder issues? Do you have acne on your face? That means that your liver and your lymph and your, your gut couldn't clear it. So it went on your face. Yeah. Um, do you have, um, when you have, when you press on your forearm, 
uh, do you see white? That's edema. That means that your lymph is overworking and it's not breaking down those fats. So there many, do you have bad periods as a woman where you're mm. really feeling right around your period that you want to, estrogen disrupts serotonin so people can actually get depressed during uh, their cycles. A lot of practitioners don't know that. So if you can't process the estrogen, which is also a fat, you've hit your fat tipping point. Mm. And so what we speak to with women that have genes that um, or polymorphisms that don't allow them to break down fat, or they are experiencing symptoms that say, hey, I'm not breaking down my fat. During their cycles, we say go very low fat. And during their ovulation time, go very low fat because your body's already making fats through the hormones that it's making to try to help you ovulate or cycle. And so to increase, obviously, the caloric load that they need to get, are you going for higher carb or higher protein in that time? Well, in that time, we just go, depending on the individual, you can go more protein. But I really think for in these in these times where the body is trying to break down fats, we go for we go for the vegetables uh, yep. that are going to be like a spinach or a cilantro or a zucchini that's high in water or a cucumber that's going to help move. And, and uh, cilantro is an ama- amazing detoxifier okay. and cucumber is so water so we look for those things and then fruits that have the enzymes watermelon being so rich in um, magnesium and um, vitamin c and also it's really really rich in arginine which helps blood flow um, and nitric oxide levels so just looking for something lighter Mm -hmm. as we're in cycle so we can um, move that detoxification pathway and and kind of support it rather than back it up it's quite interesting um we we interviewed Dr. Jack Cruz and he was talking about foods that you should not eat here in Australia in particular come down to cucumber and watermelon because of the deuterium levels in the water. Um, oh no! Which is interesting as to whether <laughs> whether or like what what options you should take then. So, um, oh, but wow. I, I mean, there's obviously other options. So other options would be zucchini is a great one. So it's yeah. also very rich in water. And again, cilantro is just incredible. Seaweed is so good. And, mm. you know, you can get some really good spirulina, a chlorella. Those are really rich in detoxifying agents. And actually sea salt. Yes. Sea salt is an emulsifier and it's minerally rich. Um, in regards to... That in water. Yeah, no, that's great. And I mean, I've just... Um... I want to do a little bit of a backflip and go back to your sulfur. So, I mean, there's obviously foods that are, are high in sulfur. Um, something that people talk about often is like you should get some offal in because the offal is going to give you the most dense nutrients, but it's quite high in sulfur. Am I right? Right. So, right. for someone in this, this situation, they're going to need to have just very lean cuts of meat, ideally. Yes. Hence yes. why the and game so- meat is quite good. The game meat is quite good. And what we have found is these game meats, um, for example, bison is very high in zinc and iron and it has more essential fatty acids than salmon if you're really getting really, really happy, happy bison. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because animal meat can actually be rich in sulfur, but it's the combined, the combined amino acids allows the sulfur to be broken down more easily. So um, interesting in how, how nature is so incredibly wise. Mm. Uh, allow it to have constituent pieces. So, for example, black beans are really, really high in, um, can be high in oxalates, but they're also really high in molybdenum. And molybdenum is, again, important for sulfur and oxalate metabolism. So, they're, they're, these, these uh, fruit sources are very intelligent, but at least in the United States, because of the glyphosate impact. And I, I will tell you, I have changed my philosophy around sulfur. I wrote a book nine years ago, and nine years ago, sulfur was not a problem. And with my sulfur genes, which I now know I have, I would eat broccoli and cabbage. I had a green, what I call my green garden soup, which was all sulfur. Mm-hmm. And at that time, I was able to process it. Yeah. But the body hit a tipping point with the onslaught of the glyphosate, which we cannot escape. And Dr. Stephanie Seneff, who's a brilliant biochemist out of MIT, one of our top universities, has elucidated the fact that even organic in the United States is not free from glyphosate. Yeah, wow. It's better, but it's not free. Yeah. Um, and glyphosate is obviously, it's used worldwide. Like we definitely use it here in Australia as well. It's definitely an issue. Um, it's what they spray on oats and wheat to kill off 
the the product before they or to yeah pretty much kill the product before they pick it so it's definitely not something that's just just in the states which is crazy um because it's definitely affecting the world who who are using it, it so um it is. when it comes to your your game meets would would pig like did pig or hogs get looked at as well or are they seen as something too too dirty a meat to eat like what's what's the outlook on pigs so what I really, I, I actually really like wild boar. And if mm-hmm. you look at wild boar, which is foraging with pine nuts and, um, you know, free range, they're very clean. Um, we have a wonderful gentleman here by the name of Joel Soliton, who has a world famous farm by the name of Polyface Farms out of Swoop, Virginia. And actually, he did his last, what he called the lunatics tour, (laughs) where he, there were 1,200 of us, and I believe there were 30 different countries. And I know that there were a lot of, um, a lot of Aussies here represented. Um, And he has developed this utopian farmland. And he spoke about how clean, you know, their, their pigs were, they're effectively wild. Mm. Um, because they were, they had specific and designated areas where they foraged in the woods. Mm. And their meat was really, really clean. And actually, wild boar and pig is, is high in leucine. And leucine is a very important amino acid in the down regulation of viral loads. And so one of my, <laughs> what I believe, our pioneering discoveries through the wild vegetarian approach is that these amyloids are tripping and reawakening, reactivating viral loads in our body. Yeah. And, and so these viral loads are puppet mastering us because they're no longer showing up as chicken pox. They're showing up as Bell's palsy or they're showing up as polycystic ovarian syndrome. I was fortunate enough to participate in a documentary series um, led by Dr. Isabella Wentz called The Thyroid Secret. And in that nine-part docuseries, I was the one that spoke to Hashimoto's being really puppet mastered by the Epstein-Barr virus. Mm -hmm. And over 80% of Hashimoto's is, uh, and 62% of uh, Graves' disease, which is the counter to autoimmune hypothyroidism, it's autoimmune hyperthyroidism, uh, is (laughs) Epstein-Barr. Or within, primarily Epstein-Barr, but within that herpes family. And so throwing more hormone at a thyroid that's under-functioning is not the answer mm. when the real culprit is the pu- the the virus that was puppet mastered by um, uh, puppet mastered the thyroid into looking like it's not working, but it's really the, it's a viral activation that was tripped by an amyloid structure. Um, here in the Washington D.C. area, which is where I practice, we have many practitioners sending us their uh, Hashimoto's uh, patients, and actually we have we've seen Hashimoto's patients from all over the world, and we have a tremendously high success rate that's sustainable using my approach. So what's kind of the first step for someone with Hashimoto's that you'd go to? So with Hashimoto's, we're going to know just from a, just from a probability perspective. And again, back to my old life where I was in numbers Mm -hmm. (laughs) in finance and um, risk management, we know that it's going to be a high probability that's a viral load. Yeah. So the first thing we have to do is stop feeding the virus. Well, Mm -hmm. how do we feed them? Stop feeding the virus. We've got to stop eating those um, foods that contain amyloids, uh, which then feed that viral load. But what's even more interesting, Maddie, is that the viruses are also fed, or the amyloids are fed by biofilm. And biofilm is that, what I call the donut, uh, which is like a a gel-like structure made by bacteria to help protect themselves. And so now we know, we've seen it, we've done the clinical research is out there. I did not do the research myself. We're just really great finders of information that's already out there, but it's in academia and it's never been applied yeah. uh, until now. And um, the biofilm helps create amyloids. The amyloids help create biofilm. The viruses hide inside the biofilm and then we they get puppet mastered. So um, that's why it's so important protein, fat, and sulfur because um, sulfur will also create some calcifications and definitely oxalate metabolism help makes biofilm because 
if your oxalate metabolism impaired, you're going to make aspergillus, which is a mold, which then makes biofilm. It's a very interesting ping pong effect, as I call it. And so a long answer to your question is they would be wilditarian. Mm -hmm. They would be low sulfur because also sulfur in most cases have the goitrogens. Um, a lot of these sulfur foods are broccoli and cabbage and collards, which are goitrogens. And what are goitrogens? They produce go goiters. They actually slow thyroid function. We don't want that. No. Yeah. Um, and then we would make them uh, so a low sulfur wild vegetarian eating the wild game because you still need protein for the thyroid of bison and venison. Cornish game hen, uh, lamb, of course, if they do not have fat metabolism issues, and then the wonderful fish, and then staying with um, the the squash, which is really important, and vitamin A, and vitamin A is super important for insulin, mm. which with thyroid, when the thyroid goes, then the insulin sometimes goes as well, and vitamin A is really important in insulin regulation. That's so interesting. So when it comes to sourcing the wild game, um, like I know you can't in America, you can't kill wild game and sell it unless it's done through a factory sort of situation. So, and it's, it's very much the same here in Australia. You can't like, there is definitely processes that would take the meat and they would then resell it. And there's different butchers that might have like a little bit of venison or a little bit of wild boar here and there. And um, anyone living in Brisbane, you can reach out to me because I know a few that do it, but what what's the process then for you guys for, for getting any sort of wild game meat? apart from hunting well, it yourself. Yeah, we're really lucky in the United States where we have several providers that mm -hmm. uh, there's one that ships overnight to all states in, in our country. Wow. And also there are some other ones that are popping up, one in Florida, there's a, a, there's one in Wisconsin, here in the metro DC area, the organic butcher. And, you know, I've spoken or had my staff speak to personally uh, with these um, small, smaller outfits how do you source your wild game you know what what farms do you use because you know anything that i recommend i want to make sure that i understand where it's being sourced from yeah. but another one uh, in terms of wild fish uh vital choice is beautiful mm -hmm. in terms of where they source um their their wild caught fish it's and shellfish it's just a very clean um very clean source of of that uh that food source so more and more is showing up because something um, you know, I, I, I invented the word wilditarianism in the approach and the lifestyle, but more and more people are catching on mm -hmm. that uh, we have to live as nature intended because we've gotten so far removed from it. And what I do know is that even if you're eating a grass fed cow, you don't know if that cow was grass finished, mm -hmm. which means that because it can be grass fed for about five minutes and then it can be corn fed for the rest. Yeah. Um, or its mom could have been a feedlot cow, and we know that DNA transfers over generations. Mm. So um, heritage breeds are really very, very clean. They don't have to be wild. We have found that heritage breeds, because they've never been adulterated, really hold um, true to nature intending the, the meats to be the way they are. Again, if you look back to millennia, these hooved animals have been on the planet forever. Well, where's the methane coming from now? Well, I believe it's in part because these animals are being fed foods that they cannot break down. And when we can't break down food, what do we do? We produce methane. Exactly, yeah. You know, they're doing the same thing. And so it's really important as this wild vegetarian and wild game um, phenomena occurs uh, in the U.S. that we really hold, hold fast to a sustainable approach and uh, a really humane approach to raising these animals in an environment that is as nature intended, that we don't create now factory farmed bison because then we're going to be in the same place we were with cows. Yeah, definitely. And so that was definitely going to be a question is what happens when it's bison that's farmed compared to bison that's just in the wild? Is there a major difference if they are, like you just said, the heritage listed ones are obviously a little bit different, but is there ones that are getting farmed? Like, I mean, you can buy bison bars and stuff in the States. Are they going to be the same quality as just buying um, the wild meat or getting the wild exactly. meat? That's a great question, Maddie. And I, I really believe this is where we have to become informed consumers, mm. right? Where are you sourcing that bison from? As the company. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have to start asking questions because if we start bastardizing the way that these animals are grown just because we want to make a profit because bison bars are really popular right now, then we're really getting away from the elemental purpose of why we're doing this in the first place, mm -hmm. uh, which is to, to be healthier. And so it's gonna it's gonna boomerang us into uh, ill health.
Yeah. So, I mean, here in Australia, in regards to things that uh, we can do as consumers, you can ask for what is wild caught in regards to the fish and the, the seafood. In particular, we've, we've got quite a, a good range of wild caught. Um, typically, you're not going to get any salmon here on the southern side or pretty much anywhere in Australia. You're not going to get any salmon that's wild caught um, salmon that you're going to be able to use. And if you do get some, it's going to be imported from somewhere like Norway, I think is probably our major, major import that we get um, wild caught salmon from so that's quite heartbreaking for some people because they do love salmon but realistically when we look into it also in regards to the food we are a lot more, um, and I did a podcast on this just a few weeks ago in regards to the Australian grass fed meat it's a lot more we're a lot different set up to what the states are for how it how it's kind of laid out but once again you don't know if it's been grain finished or not typically sometimes they'll say grain uh, grass-fed grass finished and that's obviously the best meat that you can get um but we're, we're definitely a bit more free range in regards to how it's set up there is like i said butchers that will do uh, venison, butchers that will do kangaroo and butchers that will do wild boar and they're going to all be meats that have been sourced from Australia that are actually taken just from the land. These are pest animals in Australia and they're they're then u- utilized to be as food. So I think like as much as people might get a little bit weirded out by it, kangaroo is probably going to be one of the most um, efficient sources for us here in Australia to be able to get hold of that's going to be um, as free range as possible I would say. Ostrich is also quite good. Okay, ostrich. We don't have. That's not not as easily <laughs> grabbable. Yeah, like obviously we do have an emu farms or emus are another thing. Yes. Um, but they're they're typically farms, so I would be a bit sus on that one. Um, yeah, unless you're going to go out and go hunting yourself. And I mean, we have so many. Um, critters here in Australia or pest species here in Australia that are huntable um, and huntable all year round so you, you it's a, de- a very different sort of source to what um, what you have in the states with the, the only once a year you can go hunting sort of thing and I think Australia would do really good with something like that but for right now it's not how it is and depending on where you are in Queensland in particular you can't hunt unless you've got private access New South Wales and Victoria have um public land and private land access so it all comes down to where where you kind of stand as a person what you really want to be sourcing i guess as well in regards to how deep you go down the rabbit hole exactly and i think you know it really depends on the rest of it right so if you're doing you know if you're doing wild boar but then you're doing a bunch of sugar and it's you know yeah. high frequency corn syrup and a bunch of pesticides and things are uh, colored that are not coming from nature, hmm. then you're really undermining that uh, philosophy of, of consuming wild meats and mm. wild fish and shellfish. So it's really, it's really a construct of honoring the body in every regard as to what you put in your mouth and really honoring it, how you source it and, and really being in gratitude because that's also, you know, the, the vibrational frequency. I tell my clients, Don't go shopping when you're upset because you're going to touch that food and you're going to be at a lower vibration and you're imparting that upsetness into that, you know, that apple you just you just pulled off um, the shelf. Mm -hmm. So it's really important. Intentionality is really important. It's really, you know, again, we, we are a microcosm of the macrocosm. And so conscious awareness around how we look at what brings us life, which is our food source and our water supply. We have to be very respectful of that because we're all one. Yeah. that's um. There's a Japanese study that's done around that too of just writing the word next to the fruit or vegetable and then leaving it and changing and seeing what happens on a micro level. And it's so interesting to see like literally just writing the word hate and pasting it, like pretty much sticking next to this vegetable, what would happen compared to if you write, wrote the word love and put it next to it. Um, The same thing happens with water as well when you do it. So it's so interesting what the studies are around that. Um, I think people would hear that and say, oh, that's so woo-woo. But it's like, no, this is now science scientifically backed like there's so many people that are science minded that need that and so hey there it is like it's definitely there's proof in the pudding um when it comes to i guess some of the more favorable fruits and vegetables that you should be eating and do you talk much about i haven't actually read the book it's something that i do want to do it's going it's on my list now it is the wildatarian diet the book um but when it comes to fruits and vegetables are you talking about foraging for yourself or ideally like growing your own what's what's the kind of golden standard uh, another great question. So what's really sad in the United States is the average food that goes to our plate travels 1,500 miles. Wow. So think about the carbon emissions that brought that fruit or produce to our 
you know, to our home or to our, our local grocers. And so the first thing that I would offer is really support local where mm-hmm. you're growing the food close by. So you're really, you know, breaking down that uh, carbon footprint. Uh, you're also going to get a much richer nutrient dense food because it hasn't traveled yeah, um, or hasn't b- been picked uh, and then frozen and then trucked along. across yeah. the country. So, you know, try to get as close to the tree as or the, the, the ground as possible. And then there, um, the environmental working group uh, has uh, fruits and vegetables, which are called the dirty dozen and it changes year over year. But they really speak to those fruits and vegetables that have the highest toxic load because they are sprayed the most. And so when uh, my clients ask me uh, and my naturopath, uh, what what are the ones that we should look to? Well, first we have to look at, do you have candida? Because you're not going to be eating a lot of grapes if yeah. you have candida, that's too much sugar. But typically, you know, watermelon is so thick skin now in Australia because mm-hmm. it's got a lot of deuterium may not be a great source. But, you know, those thick skin like pineapple, you, you know, it, it's it's OK. It's been protected. Yeah. But a little baby strawberry or um, which basically has no skin or a pear, apples, those and apples are the most sprayed here in the United States. And also that's um, where they catch like obviously with an apple with the way it lays out, it catches all in the stem. And if people aren't that, washing it incredibly well or they're eating that whole whole stalk and stem, then yeah. It's it does. And issues. so we really have to be mindful around. So it's not only how far the food has traveled, but how the food has been sprayed. And so when you say what are the best, I would say, well, it depends on if you have a fungal organism or a sugar imbalance. You want to stay away from those higher sugar fruits like oranges and and, um, and pineapple and banana because they carry the highest uh, sugar load. And you want to go with the lower sugar fruits like a kiwi Mm -hmm. or um, a strawberry or a blueberry. Um, And, you know, foraging for blueberries. I used to have a blueberry bush in my backyard. Hmm. Um, So it didn't it wasn't very prolific, but I did get to yield a couple of blueberries. (laughs) And I I did have I've since moved, but I did have a terraced organic garden. And so I during the summer, I really didn't have to buy a lot of my vegetables. Hmm. I grew them. They were grown with organic uh, organic soil. They were loved. I used to sing to them every morning. Uh, and I, and one of the things that I thought was also really important is that I taught my children how important it was to really honor the food and how it grew. So for Easter, every Easter as they were growing up, the Easter bunny, instead of bringing them chocolate, brought them seeds. Oh, wow. That's so cool. They would be able to then nourish and nurture these little baby seedlings to then be able to harvest them during the summer. And um, it was quite beautiful. Yeah, I love that. That's uh, awesome. <laughs> thank you. Um, and so, I mean, touching on the, the sulfur-rich foods, I think, um, goes into things like leek, onion, uh, cruciferous vegetables. So, that's like your, your cauliflower, your Brussels sprouts, um, your broccoli. You talked about kale. You mentioned cabbage as well. Is there anything else that's major in egg, in yolks. egg yolks? Yeah, so so egg yolks are rich in sulfur, but what I will say are egg yolks are really rich in choline as well. Uh-huh. So there's something that I have deemed uh, to what I call the body's hierarchy of needs. Yeah, and so when if your body has a really big need for choline, even though you're going to have sulfur in that egg, then I suggest well eat that egg over easy because it's going to have a richer choline source for you than mm-hmm. if you hard boil it, which is going to be more sulfur. Yeah. You know, when you when you actually if you if you think about an egg when you open it up, it doesn't smell like sulfur, but no, if exactly. you boil it and it gets really hard, it smells like sulfur when you peel that that um, skin back, so uh, or the shell back. So it really it really is this hierarchy of needs and and cauliflower, although really really. Um, you know, it, it can be sulfur rich in some cases because it's high in manganese and molybdenum. Manganese is really hot, really good in lowering the histamine response. Mm. I call cauliflower a kinder, gentler sulfur or, uh, food because it has other properties that if you're really having high histamine can can support, you know, bringing it down. And what I say with if you're going to eat sulfur foods, cook them because mm. raw has more sulfur compounding a raw piece of garlic can whoa you know can give people with sulfur processing headaches migraines and raw yeah. onions as well but if you cook them and you caramelize them those sulfur compounds tend to be less aggressive yeah. in the body and so um, i do believe certain cheeses will have sulfur in them as well 
I, actually, I haven't heard about that. That you'd be teaching me the, w- the way that I would think of it is if there's any preservatives in them because preservatives tend okay, to have sulfates. That's what it would probably be. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. I think so. Going back. I'd almost like to do another big spin around and go back to the fats and fat malabsorption. Um, you said that obviously you can test your stool. Or I guess this comes across for all of it. Are people typically coming to you and doing blood tests to figure out, hey, I've got a sulfur malabsorption. Hey, I've got the um, fats malabsorption. Or is there other things you can do to test? Like you said, burping before, um, before, sorry, after you're eating. Like, is there those those typical little tests you can do outside of getting genetic tests or getting blood work done? Sure. So again, I, I call it listening, understanding your body, body yeah. talk. Yeah. So it's really just like looking down your body all the way down. You know, do you have a, do you have a allergic shiners? That means you're eating a food that you're sensitive to, or do you have like puffy eyes? That means your, your lymphatic system is off. Do you have a yellow ring around your uh, mouth? That could be that your liver is really backed up. Mm-hmm. Do you have white spots on your fingernails? That means that you're low in zinc and actually there's a candida response there. Huh. Do you, do you palpate your thigh, this over here, your thyroid, and do you feel like it's a little swollen oh there's a problem there do you have bumps on the back of your arms that's malabsorption do you have you know a lot of a lot of um, middle belly that's a cortisol response cortisol insulin Mm -hmm. so yes there's a whole body body interpretation that i do and when my clients come in i am scanning them from head to toe it's one of the first things through the door yeah Yes, they walk through the door. But yes, we can do blood work. And I work very collaboratively with um, many doctors throughout the country, actually. And I have a naturopathic doctor that is in my practice. So we can avail ourselves of blood tests, of saliva tests, of urine tests. But I have developed my own form of applied kinesiology, which is muscle testing. Mm -hmm. And so what we have found is that is really, really very efficacious and highly sensitive because it's telling us what's happening in the body in real time. And what's so interesting, Maddie, is when we've had the blood work uh, done, it's corroborative to the mm-hmm. muscle testing. And so we we navigate through the body through my methodology called the Cochrane Method after my children's namesake to really understand why, you know, what's going on in the body. And so we look at neurotransmitters and hormones and pesticides and heavy metals. We look at digestive enzymes. Uh, we look at um, our pathogens of all types we look then at food we test food and so it's a very comprehensive approach to really getting a very personalized plan for that individual and so we cut we even muscle test supplements because even if let's just say that you have that sulfur processing impairment and you, we know you have those genes because we've done a genetic anal- uh, analysis based on your, your um, ancestry and so forth. And clearly you have that, but you're demyelinated. And myelin is that, I call it um, the condom on our nerves. It yeah. kind of protects the condom. <laughs> That's a great way to the, explain the, it. <laughs> uh, and when you're demyelinated or irritated in that myelin, a B vitamin can actually be irritating. Huh. And so we test. And so maybe you need that B6, but not right now. We've got to first calm that nervous system, help support the irritated sheath, and then we can introduce it. Mm -hmm. So my protocol is very intentional in A has to go before B, because if you do B before A, you're going to get a back, you know, backlash from the body and it's going to tell you. And a lot of herxing reactions, uh, which uh, herxing is like a healing crisis. Mm -hmm. We have very little in our practice because we really look to Okay, well, we've got to turn on methylation, turn on sulfation, open up that phase one liver detoxification before we start trying to kill anything yeah. or pull anything. So it's uh, it's very important in terms of a systemic approach to getting the body ready to then make it work in a different way. Yeah, that's incredible. And do you guys only work with people face to face or do you do uh, like consults online as well? We, we do consults from all over the world. We have actually a lot of Australian clients. Yeah. Um, so yes, we can. But we do ask that we look at your genes if you're going to do consults because we can't muscle test you. So I look at the symptoms. I, I cross pollinate it with where your genetic tendencies are. And then we develop a bio individualized approach. But we've had very good success from um, from that as well. What's the best genetic testing that you guys have come across? Is like is well, 23 and so- Me sourcing? Is that good enough or is it not going to no. go in detail enough? It, it's, you know, it's ever changing and they've really, you know, uh, liquefied it. There's Opus 21, there's Ancestry.com, there's um, 
Dr. Pizzorno has created something where he has over 1,800 genes. It's called IQU, mm-hmm. uh, where you can get genetic testing done in a very, very rich way. Um, IQ, Y-O-U. Yeah. He was, he's the father of naturopathy, med, naturopathic medicine here in the United States. And I know him very well. He's a good friend of mine. Um, and so that's a very robust uh, test, I think, uh, that's, that's available. Okay. And so uh, it really is what I look at. You know, there's, we have 23,000 genes. Hmm. We're not going to spend our time trying to analyze 23,000 genes. No. But w- what I do is I try to navigate to... What are the genes? I call them the, the sharks versus the minnows. Yeah. Which are those genetic predispositions, which are going to take a leg off, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. versus you know, <laughs> just, just going to annoy you a little bit. It's going to nibble. It'll nibble, but it won't, it won't amputate you. <laughs> That's great. It's once again going back to your original job, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, um, so, I mean, there's, there's obviously a few places that people can start, but um, we will start to wrap up. So, where are the best places for people to follow along, Terry? Or where, like, what's the best place? If you had your ideal way for someone to start uh, with in communications or finding things about you, would it be the book or would it be following along the socials? Like, where, where would you like people to go? So, so there, we, are, we feel that information is powerful mm-hmm. and we are here to inform. I I became so informed that I left a very significant career to really pursue what was my life passion because I wanted to be that mom for other moms that was told your child would never be normal. And I said, well, ha ha, you know, they were wrong. In your face, well, actually, yeah. Right. He's not normal. He's, he's really beyond really remarkable. So I'm very proud of him. <laughs> um, uh, so it, we really do everything we can to inform. We have we have blogs, so please sign up. You know, get on our get on our mailing lists. Uh, we have blogs um, that we put out um, once or twice a month. We put, Instagram is very robust in our uh, in our information. But yes, take our quiz, buy our book. If you want to just take a a little sampler of of how good you can feel, we have a seven day detox plan. We have we have a a more robust, what I call the heal and seal, the wild adhering heal and seal, which really speaks to your archetype, which is what wild type you are. I've broken it into four wild types and get that heal and seal. You can do a 45 day reset. And then there's a maintenance plan that has gone along with it. And I will tell you, I was at a conference and a woman uh, ran up to me whom I didn't know. And she's like, Oh my gosh, I bought your book. And that 20 year rash that I had been living with that no steroids, no creams, nothing could help. It was sulfur Terry wow. and the rash is gone. The rash is gone. So even just that alone, um, again, informing her understanding that she leads to the right wild type. Um, so that's just, the book is full of pioneering, I believe pioneering information. And we have a lot of the scientific data. If you want to nerd out on the science, we've got multiple, multiple scientific citations in the back of the book. Um, that really speak to um, how I was making these um, uh, bold uh, statements. Um, there was there was science behind it. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Well, I'm actually really excited to read the book. I'm, um, I'm definitely going to get my copy of it and uh, we'll get moving from there. But I think that's been awesome. It's been very, very insightful. I've definitely learned a few things. So thank you very much, Terry. I've, I've really enjoyed that. Um, and <laughs> listeners, if, if you got something out of it, please share it around because there, like I said, there's so much in this that it's the, the finite deta- details that we don't look into all the time that are really beneficial and can be the game changer for or you or loved ones at the end of the day. So, um, yeah, Terry, thank you very much. It's been great. My pleasure. So fun. Appreciate it. Visit thechieflife.com for all of your nutrition coaching needs, your own personalized meal plan, as well as how you can get involved with one of our seven pillar retreats.